Good morning, everyone. I first want to thank Anthony and Phil for inviting me. So I'm Samantha. I'm a, a senior lecturer at the University of Auckland. I'm also the research director of Martai Medical Research Institute, Institute, which is very, as Anthony said, it's a very new institute that's based in, in Gisborne, Tairawhiti. We've just been set up as of about two months ago. And uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Martai, who we are, what we're interested in. Um, we're just getting started, so um, we, we've got a few projects that we're really keen on pursuing. And then I'll go into a little bit of detail some, into the, some of the, uh, the research that we've just both started and also some previous research that's going to lead into the research that's going to be done at Martai. So for those of you who don't know where Gisborne is, we're right there on the east coast of the North Island. And we have um, really just, we've just been given some funding from the Provincial Growth Fund to start a sort of centre of excellence. It's an independent organisation <coughs> which is around really a focus on medical research with particular focus on medical imaging. And the, the vision here is to, to enable strength and innovation for the people of Tairawhiti through world leading medical research. And we're just getting started. This is like a little seed of, of, of us here, right here. So this is uh, our little modular building where we've just purchased a state-of-the-art MRI machine. And it was just craned in about two or three months ago. And it's on the grounds of the Gisborne Hospital. So that's the Gis uh, uh, bird's eye view of the Gisborne Hospital. And you can see it's just, it's just been placed in this little area here. And, and the whole idea here is to Really, the reason we're based there is, is we really want to have this collaboration between scientists and, um, and engineers and clinicians in the community to, to help advance the state of, um, of health in, in our region. And um, as you can see, you know, it's very similar to what you're doing, working closely with, um, with clinicians. You can see how you can advance and innovate in that area if you have that kind of close relationship. Just in the future, we've actually, this building here has just been demolished. So that's the site that we've been given for our permanent building. So when we raise a little bit more funding than we've got, we're going to be building a bigger, a bigger um, institute where we're going to have, um, have, where our people will be located. At the moment, we're leasing a building in the middle of town. So that's where our researchers are. At the moment, we're having to drive over to this little modular building here. So we really want to be together uh, here on the grounds of the Gisborne Hospital. So this is just the, some of the Martai team, some of our local people. We've got, we're a non-profit, we're a charitable trust, and we have a board of trustees uh, that's both within people within Gisborne and outside Gisborne. And we've also got a Māori advisory board that help us advise, we've, our population is 50% Māori. We have a Māori advisory board to help us sort of understand where the needs are in, 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 in Tairawhiti. And we've also got a wonderful team here, uh, local combination of clinicians and scientists and operations people. We've got our COO over here, Lee Potter, who is, is here with, with me today. So as I said, we've got a, a state-of-the-art MRI system. This is a three Tesla GE system. It's a wide bore system, so it's 70 centimetres. Most systems are 60 centimetres, so it's not, it doesn't sound that much bigger, but it's much less claustrophobic in there. So we're quite happy with, with uh, how big you can fit, fit almost anyone in this machine. And this particular machine has been designed, there was a lot of money given to, the, to GE um, by the NFL to help design a, the hardware and software that can pick up early biomarkers of concussion. And that's one of our real research interests, is to come up with early biomarkers of concussion, which is a really notoriously difficult um, symptom to, to, to well, condition to diagnose. So that's an area that we're, we're interested in, and this is partly why we, we purchased the system, because of the, the advanced hardware and software. And we've also got a wonderful collaboration with GE headquarters. They've given us a GE scientist and it's going to be, who's based in Gisborne with us, as well as up-to-date software and, and hardware as we move forward. So one of the other reasons we, we, um, we're quite happy with, with the system is, the, is this little this blanket coil. So some of you may know with the MRI, often the coils come, they're quite rigid. These are the coils that are there to receive the signal so that we can get high SNR images. Um, but this new, is quite a new technology where you can actually fold, these are 
um, wonderful sort of looped conductors, and you can fold the um, fold the blanket. You can wrap it around a baby. You can wrap it around your leg, your arm, your body. And because it's close to your body, you can pick up the signal and get pretty high SNR images, while also um, keeping the patient comfortable. So that's another another reason we quite like the system. So here are some of the areas of interest for us. We've got. Uh, We've got a few more than these, but these are some of the areas that we're, we're looking into. We've really started uh, focusing a lot on our concussion research. We're developing new methods for looking at uh, concussion. We also, um, I'm not going to go into each one of them, I'll just give you a brief overview of, 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 um, of some of them. We're also going to be doing a pilot on what we're calling the Tired Afferty Child Wellbeing Study. It's, that's where we scan children from when they're seven years old, from their head down to their waist. We want to get vascular images, we'll get the cardiac, brain imaging, images, structure, function, physiology, all in 45 minutes. And we can do that because we can go pretty fast with the scanner, um, with the software and the sort of deep learning algorithms that James spoke about. We can improve image quality so we can go faster with, with the system. So this is a study we're going to be piloting next year to see if we can um, launch into that and start a longitudinal study around that, around the child well-being. We're looking into heart disease research because we've got high rates of cardiomyopathies in our region. Prostate cancer, that's another area that we're looking at. We've got a 10-minute prostate cancer screening protocol that, um, again, is enhanced by deep learning. And we're going to be running that as a way of screening for prostate cancer in a region where it's, it's difficult to have long waiting lists and in a region where people normally have to go uh, can sometimes have to go to the biggest cities to get uh, to get screened. So, um, and we're also looking into a in collaboration with a collabor our collaborator at the University of Auckland, Miriam Shading. Uh, skating. Um, she's very interested in building up a database of our New Zealand critically endangered species of imaging MRI data as well as uh, scanning them with your Mars system so we can build up a database of, of some of our vulnerable species as an educational tool. So that's another, another area that we're keen to collaborate on. Um, and also we're looking into new methods. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, these two areas here. So with regard to the concussion research we're doing, as I said before, it's very a very difficult um, condition to diagnose. Of all traumatic brain injuries, concussion, which is a form of mild traumatic brain injury, comprise probably about 90% of traumatic brain injuries. And it uh, really has a, there's a real problem with diagnosis and prediction of recovery. And so we've built a team where we're looking at a whole lot of different things for early biomarkers, looking at portable devices like eye tracking. We're looking at simulating brain injury, uh, imaging, uh, molecular biomarkers and things like that. So we've got a number of little projects here and there going to help with concussion. And that's with the ultimate goal to come up with better treatment strategies for concussion. So we've developed a, a fast MRI protocol. These are just some of the methods that we're going to be using, or well, we are using, on people who are coming through with, with concussion. A range of structural, functional physiology. We're looking at um, amplified MRI, which is a method that we've developed look at the brain motion, 40 flow, which looks at the blood flow of the major vessels of the brain. We're looking at advanced diffusion imaging, which looks at the white, kind of white matter fibre integrity. Um, functional MRI, looking at cognitive processes in the brain, altered cognitive processes in the brain. We're looking at uh, structural, we're looking also at MR spectroscopy. And this is actually an interesting case that we just scanned last week, where someone had a a frontal lobe injury just on that side and MR spectroscopy is a way of looking at the, some of the brain metabolites. So you can look at lactate and NAA and myelinositol for instance and creatine. So this is an, a, an enhanced, um, this is lactate. We saw increased lactate here where someone got hit in the frontal lobe. So we're using a combination of these methods plus a couple more and the idea of coming up with a, a really uh, reliable biomarker for concussion. The other thing we're doing is we're um, working in with the Auckland Bioengineering Institute together um, with, so with using our advanced imaging together with these mouth guards which we're equipping our Gisborne Boys High School with. This is, this is a boy from Gisborne Boys High who's had a, um, these hit IQ mouth guards which have sensors in three different locations so you can measure the G-forces to the brain. And so the Auckland Bioengineering Institute are 
you're going to be using our data together with these impact sensors to come up with a model of what happens to the brain when you get whacked on the head. This is an example of a paper we've just published using data from uh, American football players where they've taken, we've taken the imaging data plus the kinematic sensor data and simulated what happens to uh, the brain under, under injury. So these are sort of the types of things we're going to be doing as we go forward. Um, and so the other, the other area I just want to talk, a, go into a little bit more detail about is, is new methods. And there's a particular method that is close to our heart and uh, it's called amplified MRI. And it's quite fun and I thought I'd, I'd go a little bit deeper into that, into that method. And just, just as a little bit of background, about three or four years ago now, I was sitting with a colleague um, back, I was back at Stanford at the time, and our colleague, my colleague and I were a little bit bored and we were, we were thinking, what can we do? And we thought, why not let's get inspired by watching a TED Talk? And so some of you may have seen this TED Talk. This is a, a, from a group by MIT, from MIT who have taken a real-world video and they have used some fancy algorithm to amplify the motion of the brain. And you can see, well, sorry, of the head. So you can see this person is just staring at the camera. They've taken a, a video of this person and they've taken this algorithm and they've amplified that, that subtle motion that occurs when you're just sitting here watching me, for example. So if you're watching me, your head's actually just bobbling around on its, on its neck like that. As the blood pumps from the heart, the head's going to wobble around. So we're looking at that and we thought, gosh, this is, um, this is very interesting. I wonder if we can apply this to, to MRI. After all, in MRI you can get these videos of, essentially videos of the internal structures of the body. So, for example, this is a type of MRI method which can pick up the motion of the heart. It's called a cine MRI. It's where you gate, the card you do cardiac gating, you gate and you, you time the scanner so you can gather a whole bunch of data, re-bin that data so that you can represent the heart uh, as it pumps. And we thought, okay, it's all very well that um, we can do that with um, you can image the, the motion of the heart because the heart moves a lot. What about that of the brain? So when you take these types of images of the brain, the brain doesn't actually move very much. It does move, as you can, as you can probably imagine, but it only moves by about 0.1 millimetres. And that's the resolution at which you can't pick up using MRI because the resolution of MRI is more like sort of 0.8 by 0.8 by 3 in, most, in many cases. And so we thought, gosh, um, maybe we could use this amplification technology to amplify this sub-voxel motion of the brain and potentially characterise abnormalities in the brain. So we, we did that, we ran down and we downloaded the algorithm and we amplified it by 20 times. So this is an amplification of this, what's called the Sydney MRI. We amplified it 20 times and you can see the... This is the cerebellum as it, as it drops down. Every time the heart beats, the cerebellum sort of drops down. The spinal cord sort of whips around. The, 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 the brain stem moves around. And you kind of can see that sort of pumping or piston-like motion of the brain. And we thought, gosh, um, you know, the basic thought that we had about this was that you know, different diseases might, be, might affect brain motion. And so by amplifying it, this might be a different way of looking at brain health. And we scanned a whole bunch of Chiari malformation patients just to sort of get a sort of a proof of concept that we could see different types of motion in the brain. And this is an example of a Chiari. Now, what Chiari is, is when the cerebellum kind of drops down, sort of herniates, it drops down and blocks the flow of the fluid. The white is the fluid. So it blocks the flow of the cere cerebrospinal fluid as it flows throughout the brain. And if it drops, of course, there's going to be changes in the intracranial pressure. There'll be changes in all sorts of physiology of the brain. And the brain will move in a different way. And so we scanned uh, several Chiari malformation patients. And you can sort of see that, um, I'm hoping you can see that, that the brain is kind of moving more. You can see the brain is whipping around, the spinal cord is whipping around a bit more, the frontal lobe. The brain is kind of having this more piston-like motion here uh, compared to this normal. This is an age-matched. Okay, these are five, both five-year-old boys. And so we've seen this in a lot of different... We've seen differences in motion in hydrocephalus and, and other conditions and things. So we're looking at this as a way of um, 
of maybe differentiating uh, patients with different types of, of, brain, of abnormalities of the, of the cerebrospinal fluid and uh, abnormalities that should cause a change in intracranial pressure. For those, I know you're a lot of um, smart people here and physicists and mathematicians and things, so I just thought I'd just, because I think you, I might get that question, I'll just explain, um, explain just briefly just how this amplification method works. We've got this uh, cine MRI, this is this MRI movie here that gets uh, decomposed by this, uh, it's called a steerable pyramid, so it's broken up into these different kind of spatial frequencies and there are usually about nine of these different pyramids that are broken up to spatially and then each of these different kind of pyramids are then um, filtered in the, uh, then bandpass filtered in the, in the temporal direction and the cardiac phase direction and that temporal filter is set to cover a range of, uh, of frequencies around the heartbeat. So the fundamental frequency of uh, the, the, heart, the heart, we want to pick up the motion due to the heartbeat. And, uh, and then we, these different spatial frequency components are then amplified. It's a user-defined, so we just pick one that looks good. So we've usually picked about 20. We amplified the motion by about 20. Then we add those different um, amplified components back to the original data and then we collapse the pyramid to reveal the amplified MRI image. So that's kind of briefly how it works. And what we've been doing just recently on our scanners, we've, we've now um, created a 3D acquisition so that we can see the previous algorithm, we could see it, we could amplify, well, we were doing 2D MRI and we were doing a 2D amplification algorithm, so you couldn't really visualise the motion in the other plane in 3D. So we've developed a 3D amplification algorithm which, in which you can see in the axial plane, you can see in the coronal, and you can see that kind of piston-like motion which squeezes the, you know, the ventricles and might help us also explain how the fluid is um, pushed around, around the brain. The other thing we've just done actually yesterday, I've just got this off our scanner, um, oh no, this is not yesterday, so this is just recently, about two or three weeks ago. Um, we compared this with um, the standard method. There's another method in MRI, which is called phase contrast MRI, which is a different type of method for looking at the velocities of the brain. And how it works, um, I won't go into how it works, but really what the outcome is, is that it will create, so the, the white here is like a, a, a right, um, sorry, a, a right motion, and the, the black is left. So this here is sort of a squeezing type motion that's happening in the axial plane here. And the white here in this instance means going down, and the black is going up, and the coronal you'll see here is kind of going the white is down again, the black is coming up. So you can kind of see using this other type, it's called the gold standard for picking up motion in MRI. So what we've done here is we've just compared this amplified MRI method to the gold standard way of looking at the brain motion um, called face contrast MRI. And you can see that um, because we can see the, the anatomy of the tissue, you can see, you know, you don't have to kind of interpret what these velocities mean that's sort of much better visualisation tool than the regular phase contrast MRI. So we're really excited about this method. The thing that we're working on at the moment is trying to figure out how to actually visualise these, this motion in 2D so the radiologist can look at, it, look at a sort of a heat map to say, oh, look, this is abnormal motion or this is normal motion. And we're fooling around with all sorts of different tools. One of the tools we're playing around with this is optical flow method that many of you here will probably know more about than me, but as my student has, has been working on this optical flow method, which is really giving you a sort of a distribution of the velocities of the movement of the brightness in the image. So we, we're trying to work out ways in which we can sort of show the radiologist this is, this is the sort of direction. Uh, this is just one frame of the cardiac cycle here. You can see that uh, we've caught the, the kind of middle frame where the brain is moving downwards, brain's moving downwards here and, and sort of downwards here too. So, um, so yeah, we're playing around with how, how do we display this to a radiologist so that they can uh, make some, some diagnosis or based off these 2D maps. We're also looking into this idea of, of using this method to, as a non-invasive way of looking at brain pressure. So um, there are a lot of conditions which require monitoring 
of brain pressure, such as hydrocephalus, there's idiopathic intracranial hypertension, there's all sorts of things which require monitoring of brain pressure. And so we're working in collaboration with the Auckland Bay Engineering Institute with their wonderful computational models to see if we can come up with a non-invasive index of, of brain pressure using this method. This method here, that you just see here, is really only two and a half minutes on an MRI machine. So uh, yes, while MRI is very expensive, this method, often these patients come in for an MRI anyway to see if they've got sort of an obstruction of the brain. So uh, we're thinking that two and a half minutes is, is a small price to pay if we can say, oh, by the way, and this is the pressure of your brain. So it's a, it's a big call. We haven't done it yet, but that's something that we're um, working on. We've got a model of, of intracranial hypertension on a sheep. This is a sheep brain here uh, who has a, a sheep on the left. It's the same sheep. The sheep here, as this is his baseline pressure, brain pressure, where we've collected the, we've amplified the motion of the brain, and this is a sheep, this is the same sheep where the brain pressure has been raised, and you can see the, the motion of the brain changes, and we're seeing that, we're seeing that a lot in the hydrocephalus patients, we're seeing um, the brain move more under pressure, and um, what, we, what we really need to do is we need to collect data which we know the pressure of the brain and so that we can then calibrate it and then apply it to humans. So we're working with the sheep model with the hope to translate that to humans uh, in a couple of years' time. So this is the, again, this is a collaboration with Auckland Bioengineering where we're going to be using a bunch of different MRI methods. These are methods like um, MRI angiography that looks at the vascular architecture, the 4D flow that gives us information about the blood flow going into the brain and around the brain in the, in the capillaries, and uh, in the MRIs, uh, the amplified MRIs, so that we can create a, a model of what happens to the brain under pressure. And so that's uh, one of our... Areas. I know I've gone a little bit over time, so I just want to leave that one and just mention that we're really open to collaboration. We love collaboration. We've got a new system there, and we're offering these pilot grants. Uh, it's four hours. If you've got a good idea, uh, if you've got ethics, or you might in some cases not need ethics because we've got, if it's a healthy, uh, if it's just a test of a method, we've got a healthy volunteer ethics um, a research uh, a consent form. So, yeah, if you've got a great idea and you're, you're happy to come and hang out with us and, at Martai and Gisborne, then just be in touch. That's our website, and um, we, can, uh, we can look into your proposal. And we're definitely having a lot of fun. Last week, we scanned some sharks. Um, we scanned a hammerhead and a marco shark and a bronze shark. And this was actually a, to support a PhD student who's looking into the hearing of the sharks, and I was just more interested in what the teeth of the shark look like. So that's a slice of the teeth, and there's a little brain. You know, little brain. So sharks, of course, have a little brain and very, very big teeth. They've also got very, very big optic nerves. They're absolutely massive. Um, so it's quite, quite neat. To, so we're having quite a lot of fun there, and uh, down there, uh, up there in Gisborne. So yeah, I just want to thank um, all of the supporters here. We've got. Um, wonderful, wonderful support. We've, of course, the Provincial Development Unit and Trust Tide are big supporters of us, as well as other local trusts and other granting agencies and things. So I just want to thank you for inviting me. It's just wonderful to be here and, and meeting and meet everyone as well. And uh, thanks a lot.